and we talked as pastors during the trip, and one of the things that we shared with one another is that our, in a lot of ways, our fundamental role as pastors with our congregations is to point out and show them God is at work every moment, every second, constantly in our lives, and the problem is we miss it. And so as pastors, our job is to point out and say, do you see this is God at work? Let me pray for a second as we wrap up our sharing time. Father, you are at work. You are at work in this church. You are at work in the churches in this community. You are at work around this nation and around the world. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you have allowed us to be a small part of what you are doing. Not because of any greatness of our own, not because we had something special to offer, but just because you loved us. Lord, help us to invite and assist the people around us to know you and to live more and more in light of who you are. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. There's been the question of how do we continue um, what we've been doing. For those who don't know, I send out an email every week. It's called the Midweek Moment. And in that, we have ways that you can be praying. Uh, And I would encourage you, if you have not signed up for that, sign up for that. And a simple way to sign up for that, and I'm about to create more work for the office, but they'll forgive me later, maybe. Um, On on the uh, bulletin you receive, there's a response card, a connection card. Just write on there somewhere your name, your email address, and that you want to receive the midweek moment. And we'll make sure that you get that every week. Uh, There are opportunities to serve at FBC and would encourage you to do that. Become involved in that. And if you've not built the habit, the discipline of giving to FBC, even if you just give 1% of your income, start the discipline of giving and participating and supporting the process of inviting and assisting people as they seek to follow Christ. Well, we've got a number of folks here today who um, are just starting out at Letourneau. School year has kicked in for a number of folks. And I thought I would begin this morning by telling you a school story. Uh, This this is dangerous because I'm going to reveal my age. Um, I was in college in 1986. I won't tell you what year I was in college, but I was in college in 1986. I was in college in New York, upstate New York. And one of my really good friends was a guy named John, Johnny D. I will not say his last name in case by some random occurrence he actually hears this. Um, Johnny D was brilliant, incredibly gifted writer. In fact, that's what he does. He writes books now for a living. That's what he does. Incredibly gifted writer. Loved politics. And so when John had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and spend a semester studying with some of the most powerful, influential elites of the political realm in the fall of 1986, John said, absolutely, I'm going to do that. John was brilliant. John was not wise. You see, something else happened in the fall of 1986. The New York Mets made the World Series. John loved writing. John loved politics. But John really loved the New York Mets. Now, in this Washington, D.C. program, not only was John working with politicians and aides and things like that, he had to take classes. And classes meant writing papers, and classes meant taking exams and things like that. And wouldn't you know it, for one of his classes, the midterm fell on game one of the World Series and the Mets were in it. And so John did what all of us would naturally think to do. He went to his professor and said, can I take the exam early? Uh, The Mets are in the World Series for the first time since I was three years old. And I want to be able to watch this game on TV. 
And the professor said, unsurprisingly, no. You're going to come take the midterm. And John said, unsurprisingly, if you know John, sorry, I guess I'm going to have to miss the midterm. Kids, don't try this at school. (laughs) This is how you go from being dean's list in an Ivy League university to being on academic probation in one semester. See, John was brilliant. But John had the problem in many areas of his life in taking something that was less important and making it the most important thing. And I am very concerned that in some ways that is happening in churches today all over the place. That we are taking things that might be good, that might be important, but we are making them the core, central purpose of the church when they are in fact not. We are wrapping up our series on the church this week, so if you're just visiting or you're just coming in from Laterna, you're actually getting kind of the capstone message of the series. The series has been called DTR, to find the relationship. And over the course of this series, what we have seen is that Jesus is the one who builds the church. It is not us. We have looked at what is the nature of the church by examining different metaphors that the Bible uses, the New Testament uses, to describe the church. And we've seen that the church is a family, and that speaks to the the closeness and intimacy that we are to have with one another. The church is a body. There's to be great diversity within the church, and each one has a critical role to play. The church is a people. We are an embassy placed here in a world that does not know Jesus that we may, through our influence in this culture, be ambassadors. The church is a temple. It is a place where God has a very unique and special relationship with his people. The church is a flock. The church is under the authority of God and under the authorities that he has put in place for our protection, for our good. We then transition to looking at what the church does, and we've, we've seen that the church is, is responsible for the right preaching of God, God's word, is responsible for worshiping the one true God, and is responsible for impact on the world around us. And we said that we can summarize what the church is, the nature of the church, in one sentence. The church is a family of believers who are built by and belong to Jesus. We are united. We are set apart And we're set apart that we may worship God and that we may proclaim the gospel. And as we made clear through this series, proclaiming the gospel is not just proclaiming the gospel to people who do not know Jesus, although that is true. It is also the ongoing, constant proclaiming the gospel to one another, reminding ourselves as believers of the truth of who God is, who Jesus is, and what he has done for us. This week, we wrap up the series by looking at what I think is the final, the core, the central purpose of the church. The church is commanded to make disciples of Jesus. And we're going to look at the very last paragraph of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. I would encourage you to turn there in your Bibles if you have it with you. And in that last paragraph, we find that Jesus has been crucified. He has been raised from the dead. He is just about to ascend back into heaven. These are his final words in Matthew to his disciples. And in these final words, Jesus gives a command. And that command is to make disciples. And as we look at Matthew 28, we're going to see the nature of the command. And we're going to see how we are to fulfill it. And then we're going to wrap up by looking at the implications for us as a church as well as for us as individuals. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. And the first two verses give us the context. Now the 11 disciples, remember Judas is no longer with them. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Let's stop there for a second. Matthew doesn't name the mountain. There's speculation as to what it could be, but, but that's not the point to him. The point is not which mountain it is. He's really more concerned about two other things. First, that they were obedient. And second, that obedience meant going to Galilee. Why is Galilee important? You remember Galilee is where everything started. This is going back to the beginning. This is going back to where everything commenced. And it's like Jesus is re-sending them, recommencing. It's a handoff of his ministry. Notice that there are two responses according to verse 17. It says that they worshipped him, that they probably refers to the 11 disciples. Let's come back here, buddy. Thank you. The they probably refers to the 11 disciples. But some, this is probably a whole different group. The some doubted. Remember, Jesus was followed by many, many people, not just the 11 core apostles or disciples. They were followed by many people, and it seems like this is a totally different group. Now, here's what's interesting about this word doubted. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. And the Greek word that's translated here has the idea of doubt and hesitate. By the way, when I shared with Ann that I was going to start trying to write here because this makes more funny or makes it more um, just natural for me, um, it's not accurate to say that Ann giggled. It's not accurate to say that Ann rolled on the floor, rolled on the floor laughing hysterically. It was somewhere in between and usually one or the other for about four days. Um, she said, you know, no one can read your writing. I was like, I know, but it just is what feels natural to me. So the idea is that these people hesitated. These were people who saw Jesus, had been followers of Jesus, and when they see him in this resurrected state at this moment, they don't know what to do about him. But the 11 do the only thing that is appropriate to do. And the only one it is appropriate to do it with is God. They worship. They worship. The passage continues, and this is where Jesus steps up and speaks. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, here in Jesus, in these final words, gives this core command to every believer, to every Christian who will follow these disciples, this core command to the church. And this core command, which is in verse 19, comes down to this. We must be about the business of life transformation. The command is about life transformation. You see, the core is here. Go, make disciples of all nations. Quick aside, you may have heard people translate this as as you go, or going, make disciples. There's a reason for that in the Greek. I actually do not think that's an accurate reflection of what's going on in the Greek. Go is part of the command. They are to go, command, and make disciples. Command. Why does that matter? Here's the difference. If all we are saying is, as you go, make disciples, then making disciples is an add-on to your daily practice. It's an add-on to your daily routine. But if go is a command, and it does seem to function that way here, then here is Jesus' intention. When the disciples walk off that mountain, they are to be intentional. They are to be looking for opportunities. They are to be paying attention in their conversations with one another and with people around them of, where is my opportunity to make disciples? It will infuse and infect 
every single thing that they do because it is the business that they are about. They are to go and make disciples. So what is a disciple? The word disciple, the Greek word that's translated, really has two parts to it. We tend to only focus on one of them when we talk about disciple. It does mean to be a learner. It means to be a learner who is under the authority of a master. But that's actually only part of the definition. Because it also means to be someone who is committed to someone or something else. The idea is not that you're going to be a learner sitting in a classroom and gaining information from someone. The idea is that you are committed to your master, to following your master, and becoming like your master. You see, the goal wasn't just to learn information from a teacher. The goal was to live like the master, and the master had authority over every single area of his disciples' life. The master wasn't just trying to pass on knowledge. The master was trying to shape that disciple to think and value and respond to the world just like he did. So let me give you an example. Let's say there were disciples in every aspect of the first century. There were Jewish Rabbis and disciples, it was common in Rome, it was common in in, uh, Greek cultures. But Jesus was in a Jewish culture. So let's say that you have a rabbi in working with disciples. What this rabbi would want them to do is to memorize scripture that the rabbi assigned them, and he would also have them memorize word for word his interpretation of that scripture. No questions asked, no debates. This is how I understand the scripture This is how you are to understand the scripture. In fact, you're going to memorize it. And then they were to get to the point in life that these disciples could apply that scripture automatically. So I'm going to make this up. Let's say a rabbi believed, and this would be, shall we say, lame. um, But let's say a rabbi believed that if you see someone who has a limp, you should avoid them. So here's how the process would work. Like I said, that would be lame. (sighs) I had to work a little hard for that one. Um, I'm getting some love back there from Pastor Guapo. Actually, no, I'm not. Um, If this is what the rabbi believed, he would have scripture that caused him to believe that. And he would say to his disciples... Here's this scripture, and I want you to memorize it word for word. And then he'd have his reason for thinking that that's what the scripture believed, his interpretation, or that's what the scripture said. And so he would say, here's my interpretation, and I want you to memorize this interpretation word for word. But then the rabbi would go beyond that. The the disciples of a rabbi would live with him. They would be around him every day. They would fight to be as physically close to him as they could. And so as this rabbi is walking through town, if they see someone come in the other way that has a limp, this rabbi is going to move to the other side of the road and the expectation is that the disciples would move with him. And he would drill this into them again and again and again. And the goal would be that when the disciple is on his own and he is walking through town and he sees someone with a limp up ahead of him, the disciple doesn't even think. He just goes to the other side of the road and avoids the person with the limp. Again, I made that up. There's no rabbi that ever taught that. But here's the point. Here's your one-sentence definition of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is someone who lives out the intention of becoming like Jesus. A disciple is someone who lives out the intention of becoming like Jesus. Being a disciple is intentional. It is not something that you drift into. It doesn't happen by accident. There has to be the intention that this is what I want. This is my desire. This is what I want for my life. I want my life to look like Jesus. I want to respond automatically to the situations of life the way Jesus would respond to them. But you can't just sit in that intention. It has to be something that is lived out. It has to be something that affects our thinking, our values, our actions, our relationships, the way we talk, 
what we hope for, what our priorities are. And Jesus gives the reason that this is what he commands the disciples. He gives the reason that this is his final word, his final direction, what he wants them to, what he wants them to do as they leave this mountain. He gives the reason for all of that in verse 18. And in verse 18, he says, the reason that you must go and make disciples is because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There is not a single speck of all of creation. There is not a moment of time, past, present, or future that does not belong under Jesus' authority. Jesus is saying that he is master over every person, every nation. He is the one that is in, deserves all allegiance. And you see, when we invite people to become a disciple, what we are doing is we are inviting them into reality. The reality is, just as the rabbi had all authority over the disciple, Jesus has all authority over all creation. And the only right way to relate to him is to say, I want to follow you with all of my life. And the core function of the church is to invite and assist people to live in reality. It is to live in reality that Jesus is the master over every moment of their lives. But the problem is, it is so incredibly easy for us to put other values, other purposes, other goals in place of making disciples. Churches think that the goal is to make converts, but this is not what Jesus commanded. The goal is to make disciples. We think that the goal is to make churchgoers or to make people who live moral lives or to make people who will be happy and successful. But Jesus did not command these things to the disciples. What he commanded is that you would make people who live out the intention of becoming like me. One of the blessings I had during this 40 days of prayer happened just Thursday night. I had this incredible opportunity to spend three hours with someone who's brand new to the church. And he shared with me that as a 16-year-old, he had done kind of the thing that you do. He had come forward, he'd said a prayer, but he said, you know, I think I really became a Christian in the last two to three weeks. Because it's been within the past two to three weeks that I have said, I want to be a follower of Jesus and that has completely, radically changed his life, where what he used to be about was getting vengeance on people that, is, that had done him wrong. In the last two to three weeks, he has seen the Holy Spirit take his life and change it to say, now I'm a person who prays for their good. Where he has seen that he has been all about making decisions that build him up and make him look good and make him look better. Now he's about how do I love people and help them to grow? Where he has been about, how do I, I get the most that is pleasurable for me and is desirable for me? It's now, how do I love other people well? That's what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. That is what we are called to. The church's goal is to be a part of lives being transformed as people live out the intention of being like Jesus. When the disciples left that mountain, they had an assignment. They were to leave that mountain as disciple makers. They were to be alert for, look for, seize opportunities to invite and assist people to become like Jesus. Verses 19 and 20 show us how they are to do that. The command in verse 19 is that the church must be about life transformation. But the way that the disciples are to apply that is to have a total identity transformation. See, that's what is behind these commands in verses 19 and 20, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey all that Jesus commanded. Baptism was something that was actually common by the time that Jesus was around. It was used in Jewish context, and it was used 
when people wanted to, in a very special way, in an extra way, above all the other things that were part of the Jewish day-to-day life, say, I want to be pure before God. To do something in the name of someone is to, in that culture, meant that you are doing it to align it yourself with that person, to, with that person, to align your purposes with that person's purposes, to align your values, your goals with that person. So when Jesus says to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he is saying that we are inviting people to be pure, to be righteous with the God of the Bible, and to align themselves with him. Jesus has revealed who God is. Jesus has revealed what it means to be right with him. And Jesus has revealed what it means to live for his purposes. And that's what we are inviting people to. When Jesus has baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's what's being talked about. It is the declaration that I believe this is who God is. God is who Jesus revealed him to be. I want to be right with him, and I want to align myself with him. And once someone has started down that path, we then take the step of teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. Teaching them to obey all of Jesus' commands means that a disciple changes his life, shapes his life to the life and teachings of Jesus. In my entire life, when I read these verses, what would immediately come to my mind is a to-do list. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't hang out with these people. Hang out with those people. It was a checklist. And it was all about behavior. It was all about do this, don't do this. But here's the problem. Have you ever stopped and think about what Jesus commands? There's a whole bunch about behavior, but then Jesus will say something like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You mean Jesus' commands includes who I love, how I love them, and who I love most of all? Jesus will say, take up your cross and follow him. In other words, Jesus' commands includes our priorities and our values. It's not just about our behavior. Obeying Jesus' commands isn't just about do this and don't do that. It is about being changed at the very core of who we are. What is our part in that? We've said it over and over again this morning. We invite and we assist. We invite people to know who God is and to know that they can be made right with him. And then we help people know God and get right with him. Our job is to invite and assist people to know what Jesus teaches, to know that it affects every area of their lives and to assist them in living that out. We are inviting and assisting people to be completely transformed at their very, very core to stop putting themselves as the highest priority like this guy spent time with the other night and like he is doing now to start saying, to stop saying no one else, no one's gonna tell me what to do and instead start saying, I have a savior and I want to be just like him. We have a couple that is brand new in the church. The husband, and I have permission to share this, is an alcoholic. He struggles with relapses. He has had jail time. He is sitting here this morning. His wife came to Christ three months ago. And they are asking the question, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus in our marriage because we've never had to answer that question before. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus when the husband relapses? What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus when raising our kids? Those are the questions that they're wrestling with. The temptation as a church is to answer that question by saying, you know what, we're going to start a group for you. We're going to start a class. We're going to start a program. 
and they'll go figure it out. But you know what's happened here at FBC? FBCers have come around them, and they are inviting them to know more about Jesus and helping them. If the husband relapses, these people remind him of God's love and grace, and they invite him to repent, to believe that God still loves him and God can change his life and move forward and follow him. We have a woman in this church who has a very similar background, who is connecting with this wife and is answering her questions, encouraging her, helping her by pointing her to say, this is who Jesus is. Let me help you get to know him a little better. Let me help you know what it's like to walk with Jesus and live with Jesus. People are around them inviting and assisting, inviting them to say, this is who God is, come closer. Assisting them by saying, let me help you by sharing what I have learned as I walk with Jesus. Let me help you by encouraging you in your walk. It's going to be okay. God is at work in you. And encouraging them by saying, let me pray with you. Let me pray for you. This is what it looks like to make disciples. It's not about a program. It's about entering lives. Now, watch this. This couple, brand new Christians, recently walking with the Lord, they know very little. But they invite the people around them in their lives to say, I don't know much, but I know Jesus has changed my life. You want to come to church with me? Do you want to know more about them? They are making disciples. I want to take a second to wrap up by just showing what is the process of transformation. How does this happen? If you are apart from Christ, the inner core of who you are is all about self. You are a lover of self. Everything in your life centers on you, and it's up to you to build a good life. And what that means is that you are constantly striving for love and acceptance and well-being. You're wanting good things to happen for you, but it's outside of you and you are trying to reach for it. And so you look at all of the different areas of life. You look at your work and say, through my work, I'm going to try to get love and I'm going to try to, try to have the good life. Through my family, I'm going to try to, try to feel love and accepted. I'm going to use God to try to get those things. I'm going to use the church to get those things. I'm going to try to use my wealth, the things I own, the people around me. It's all about how do I use these things that are in my life to try to help me feel accepted and to try to believe that things will go well with me. We are constantly deploying strategies for how we can make the different areas of our lives work for us, that we feel accepted and we feel like things are going well. If you're a workaholic, then you are living in this circle. If you're a manipulator of people, then you live in this circle because you are using your work, you are using your people to try to help you feel like you are accepted and like you feel like life is going to go well for you. And there are so many other things that we can list. If you struggle with telling the truth, if you struggle with addiction, great, there are many other things that go into that. But that's part of what's going on there. And we can make our relationship with God all about us just as much. And so we come to church and what we want from church are rules to get God on my side or principles to make life a success. And all we are doing is trying to get, use God as a vehicle that we would feel accepted and that we would feel like we matter. And the answer is not to give more rules and principles. The answer is to speak the gospel to one another. And to remind one another that when we are guilty, when we are God's enemies, when we are lovers of self, when there is no reason whatsoever for God to want to pursue us at all, he came and sent his son that we might be forgiven, made God's child, and invite us to be his followers. 
He is in the process of taking self-centered lives and transforming them into mature followers of Jesus. And then he starts rewriting our lives, so it looks like this. Our identity has changed. We are a child of God. And that means the love and the sense of well-being, the reality that things are going to work out for our good, is in fact guaranteed. It is hardwired into our relationship as a child of God. And so instead of looking at the things around us, we say, how do I go to my family and I show them the love of God and the desire for their good? How do I go to work in my work relationships and show people the love of God and the desire for their good? How do I use my money? How do I use my possessions? How do I even relate to my enemies in a way that shows them God's love and his desire for their good? Because God's love for us is certain, we can impact others. And the the journey of discipleship The entire Christian life is all about moving from the left circle to the right circle in more and more areas of our lives. And the way that we do that is we speak the gospel to one another and remind ourselves, when you are doing this, it seems like you are living in the left circle. You are trying to gain what you already have through Christ. You are loved and God desires is good for you. We invite, we assist. If you're a workaholic, you stop trying to feel, feed your soul through your work. If you're a manipulator, you try, stop trying to feed your soul by getting your own way. If you struggle with honesty, you try, try, stop trying to feed your soul through self-protection. And you say, I believe that the second circle, the love and, and well-being that I desire is guaranteed. It's interesting that um, Valerie and Daryl Ash just took a trip to a closed country, communist country, spend time in a church there, working with folks that are in ministry, actually there and all over the world. And Valerie's comment when she came back was this. It was remarkable because these Christians there didn't divide Christian life here, work life here, family life here. They were disciples, and it affected every area of their lives. They couldn't separate. She said it was so compelling. We loved to be around these people because everything that they did, every decision that they made was in light of how do we help Show people that God loves them and desires their good. Whether it's my fellow believer or whether it's someone who doesn't know Christ. That is what they did in every single area of life. It never left their mindset. And this church in a repressive communist country has 700 people because people live like this. And Valerie said, this is what you've been trying to tell us about, isn't it? Yes. Because when we become a church like that, people look at us and say, how can you explain that? And we point to Christ and say it is him. The central purpose of the church is to make disciples of Jesus. And we do that by inviting and assisting. And that takes us to the point of the passage and the point for us. The core assignment of the church is to see lovers of self transformed into mature followers of Jesus. My friend Johnny D was incredibly gifted, but all the gifts and talent in the world could not help him once he got his priorities wrong. Church, we may not misplace our priority and become more concerned about how gifted we are, how talented we are, how slick our programs are, than we are concerned about seeing people become more like Christ. So we respond to this message like this. Invite someone to follow Jesus. 
assist someone in following Jesus. And I would encourage you to take a second and write down how you will do that. Think of one area of your life, and you can probably think of a hundred of them. I know I can, where you need to become more like Jesus and talk to someone about them. Invite someone to assist you. On those connection cards I referred to earlier, if you would just indicate on there how you want to apply the message, and you can slip them in one of the boxes that are in the foyer, we as a staff will pray for you as you go on this journey of being a disciple. This is what Jesus has called us to. I want to close in prayer. And we need to pray because transformation does not happen by our own power. It happens by the power of God. So would you stand with me as we close and we go before the God who loves us and say, Father, change us. And as a church, make us a disciple-making church. Heavenly Father, we are blown away by what you have done for us. We are blown away by your love that does not fail, your love that is complete in every way, your love that is expressed sacrificially. Your love for us is the love that we desire with all of our hearts, but we look for it in every other place. And your love for us is changing our lives if we will just say we want to be your follower. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we leave here just like the disciples left that mountain. We leave here with a command in our ears. Go make disciples. Lord, help us be aware of the opportunities to invite and assist one another and those around us that they may know Jesus and become more like him. Open our eyes and give us courage. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.